Hello everyone and welcome to this virtual walk around some of the memorials and graves at Brunswick Street Cemetery in Royal Leamington Spa. Normally in September each year the Leamington History Group organises walks around the cemetery and very popular they've been too. They normally last around two hours and in recent times Barry Franklin has been the guide. The COVID-19 pandemic has put paid to the walks in 2020, but we can still look at a few of the graves, although it will take just over 20 minutes rather than the two hours. One advantage to a virtual tour is that we don't have to worry about the weather, so you can put your umbrella and sun cream away. Another advantage is that I can put a photograph of the blossom on this slide. You wouldn't see that in September. Okay, so let's have a look at 10 of the more interesting memorials. This is a group of local people looking at the William Riley Memorial in 2014. It's very large and impressive, but that isn't the reason for our interest. This image is on one of the three faces at the top of the monument, and so we wondered, why is this scene of a ship in distress on the high seas and a lifeboat on a monument in Royal Leamington Spa? William Riley was born in 1815 and died on the 1st of May 1904 at the age of 89. He lived for some years at Florence House in Lem Terrace after moving from Birmingham. Several years before his death, he had erected his monument in Leamington Cemetery and he left instructions in his will for a marble bust of himself to be carved in Florence and placed on top of his tomb, a request which unfortunately was never carried out. He also endowed beds in local hospitals and left a significant bequest to provide a lifeboat on the east coast. The lifeboat was stationed at Upgang near Whitby and named the William Riley of Birmingham and Leamington. The lifeboat took part in the rescue of 154 people on board the hospital ship SS Rohila which was wrecked off Whitby in October 1914. The lifeboat had to be hauled three miles overland and lowered down a cliff to assist in the rescue. Many years later, the old lifeboat was found derelict on the River Tour in Barnstable, Devon in 2007 and was bought by the Whitby Historic Lifeboat Trust who restored it to seagoing condition. It is now one of a small number of surviving road lifeboats and can be found in pristine condition at Whitby. Corporal William Amy VC William Amy was born at Duddeston, Birmingham on the 5th of March 1881. He joined the 8th Battalion of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment in 1914 and was rapidly promoted to Lance Corporal, winning the military medal during the First World War. On a foggy autumn morning on the 4th of November 1918, his unit was engaged in an action on the Western Front. William Amy's gallantry that day led to him being awarded the Victoria Cross, Britain's highest award for bravery. His citation reads, for most conspicuous bravery on the 4th of November during the attack on Landrecies, France, when owing to fog, many hostile machine gun nests were missed by the leading troops. On his own initiative, he led his section against the machine gun nest under heavy fire, drove the garrison into a neighbouring farm 
and finally captured about 50 prisoners and several machine guns. Later, single-handed and under heavy fire, he attacked a machine gun post in a farmhouse, killed two of the garrison and drove the remainder into a cellar until assistance arrived. Subsequently, single-handedly, he rushed a strongly held post capturing 20 more prisoners. He displayed throughout the day the highest degree of valour and determination. His Victoria Cross was presented to him by the King at Buckingham Palace in February 1919. He subsequently moved to Leamington Spa, where he lived for the rest of his life working as an agent. He died in Warnford Hospital on the 28th of May 1940. The house at York Road where Edward Green Antrobus CMG and George Pollock Antrobus OBE died was the first to be hit by a German bomb on the 14th of November 1940. Edward died on his 80th birthday along with his 49 year old son George at their home at 15 York Road. Edward had just returned home after attending a party at Mr and Mrs Millet's flat at 32 Portland Place. Edward Green Antrobus was born on the 14th of November 1860 at St John's, Withyham, and was educated at Charterhouse. He served in the Office of Crown Agents for the Colonies from 1878 until 1920 having been awarded the honour of Companion of St Michael and St George, the CMG, in 1915. Edward Antrobus was a senior member of the civil service and retired after the First World War. He had lived in Leamington for some years, having previously been the occupant of the house opposite the church on Warmington Hill, on the road between Leamington and Banbury. His son George was born on the 12th of October 1892 and was educated at Westminster School and Christchurch College, Oxford. He became a King's Foreign Service Messenger in 1918. By the time of his retirement from the service in 1940, he had served seven foreign secretaries and was a senior King's Messenger. He was awarded the OBE for his services. He wrote a book of his memoirs entitled King's Messenger 1918 to 1940 Memoirs of a Silver Greyhound. The last chapter was handed to his publisher on the day that he died. This shows the devastating damage caused to 15 York Road by the first of a string of bombs that were dropped across the town. It was the same night as the Coventry Blitz. Bomb four dropped on Lipton's grocery shop on the parade and killed two army sergeants who were sheltering in Lipton's shop doorway. One of the soldiers was 31 year old Sergeant Charles William Welsh. Smoke Company was formed at Leamington Spa on the 11th of November 1940 under Major S. Lansley, Officer Commanding. Charles transferred to Smoke Company of the Pioneer Corps on the 12th of November 1940. Two days later, he was dead as a result of a German bomb. At Brunswick Street Cemetery, there are a number of Commonwealth War Graves. Charles was buried in the War Graves area at Brunswick Street. Sergeant Welsh's colleague was Sergeant Thomas Landles, also from Smoke Company. He was born in Edinburgh and was returned to Edinburgh for cremation.
Known in the boxing world as the Leamington Licker, world middleweight boxing champion Randolph Adolphus Turpin died at the young age of 38. His life was a classic rags to riches story that unfortunately ended in tragedy. Randolph was born in a basement flat at Six Wills Road, Leamington Spa on the 7th of June 1928 and his birthplace is now marked by a blue plaque. He became world champion on the 10th of July 1951 when he defeated the American boxer Sugar Ray Robinson at Earl's Court in London. Two days later, he came home to Leamington amid scenes of great rejoicing. The streets were jammed and an estimated 20,000 people and newsreel cameras waited in the parade for Randy to appear on the town hall balcony, flanked by the mayors of Leamington and Warwick. In the rematch with Robinson at the Polo Grounds in New York on the 12th of September of the same year, he lost the title when the fight was stopped in the 10th round. Life was never the same again for Randolph following the defeat. He made a number of disastrous financial investments and was declared bankrupt. On the 17th of May 1966, he was found dead with a gunshot wound to his head in the upstairs room of a cafe he owned in Russell Street. An inquest decided that he had taken his own life by shooting himself with a revolver. Joe Ballwood was a Leamington man, born in 1835 and the son of a canal boatman. Like many young men before him, Joe was looking for a more exciting life than working on the canal, and as a fresh-faced lad of 18, he enlisted in the British Army, joining the 13th Light Dragoons. The regiment was soon in action during the Crimean War, and Job was present at all of the major engagements. He took part in the now infamous Charge of the Light Brigade at Balaclava, when five regiments of the British cavalry were ordered on a heroic but suicidal charge against massed Russian artillery. Job had two horses shot from beneath him, and of the 673 men who made the charge, fewer than 200 returned to answer the roll call. Job was discharged as time served after 12 years with the Colours and returned to Leamington to marry Phoebe Harridan. He had a number of poorly paid jobs as a groom and coachman, reflecting his former involvement with horses but in common with many of his former army colleagues, theirs was a rather impoverished existence. He died in a Morton Street almshouse on the 18th of December 1903 at the age of 68. Many hundreds of people lined the streets for his funeral, which was conducted with full military honours. His headstone was paid for by friends and colleagues. This is probably one of the saddest stories. The Place family came to Leamington in 1866, following the death in London of Frederick William Place, the head of the family in the summer of that year. The family had lived for several years in India, where William had been the proprietor of the Delhi Gazette newspaper. Several of the Place children, including Emily and her brother Reginald, had been born in India. Eliza Place and her three daughters, Emily, Ada and Catherine, occupied Warnford Lodge, which is now 16 Russell Terrace, Leamington. On a frosty morning in January 1867, the three sisters decided that since the River Lem was frozen over, they would like to try their hand at skating. In company with the three sons of the Milverton Vicar, the Reverend J. H. Smith, they ventured onto the ice near Nightcare House off Warwick New Road. No, no sooner had they skated away from the bank when there was a loud crack 
and the ice broke, plunging the girls into the ice cold water. Many desperate attempts at rescue were made, but Emily and Ada sank under the ice and drowned, and only Katie was saved. The memorial records the death of the sisters and also of their father Frederick and their only brother Reginald, who died of cholera in 1878 at the age of 29 while serving with the army in India. Katie, who survived the accident on the ice, lived to the age of 78 and is also commemorated on the memorial. Eddie Hapgood, England football captain. Edris Albert Eddie Hapgood was born in Bristol on the 24th of September 1908 and died at Roxall Abbey Hotel near Warwick on Good Friday the 20th of April 1973 at the age of 64. Eddie first played football professionally for Kettering Town who paid him the princely sum of £4 a week and allowed him to carry on with his regular employment as a milk roundsman. After playing 12 games, he was sold to the Arsenal and made his debut against Birmingham City on the 19th of November 1927 and soon became the club's regular left back. He won his first England international cap against Italy on the 13th of May 1933, became captain of Arsenal in the same year and captain of England in 1934. In May 1938 he was selected for the England tour of Europe. The first match was against Germany in Berlin in, in front of the Nazi hierarchy. The England players were forced to give a Nazi salute, which they did very reluctantly. It was felt that any slight to their German hosts might provide a spark to set Europe alight. Eddie also captained England in Italy, where they played in front of the dictator Mussolini. When he retired from playing for England, the Football Association gave him a testimonial of £100. After service with the RAF during the war, he returned to Arsenal and retired from football in December 1945. He had played 434 games and had made 30 appearances for England. He came to live in Leamington in 1970. Commander Morton Sanders United States Naval Officer. Morton Sanders was born in July 1842 in Mississippi in America. His father was the United States Attorney for Kentucky. He was one of a large family which like many others was divided by the Civil War. Two of his brothers fought for the Confederates and two fought for the Union. His older brother William rose to the rank of Brigadier General in the Union Army. As a young man, Morton Sanders joined the US Navy and graduated from the Naval Academy in 1861. He gained several promotions and served with great distinction throughout the Civil War. On one occasion, he was nearly drowned when his ship, the side-wheeled war sloop USS Saranac, was wrecked in the Seymour Narrows in British Columbia. Promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Commander in 1877, he was granted leave of absence and decided that he would visit England. In the summer of 1878, he was staying at Leamington at the Regent Hotel with his sisters and a nephew. On the 11th of July, he planned to return to London and having a few hours to spare before their train left, the party decided to hire a rowing boat at the Portobello Inn at Emscott for an afternoon on the river. As the ladies rowed the punt, Morton Sanders read pieces of poetry. Whilst reading, he suddenly fell backwards and died. A local doctor confirmed that his death was due to heart disease.
This must be the heaviest tomb in the cemetery and it's for Edward Tracy Turner Alley. Tracy Turner Alley was born in London on the 13th of October 1813. His grandfather was an immigrant Italian count. His father Peter was royal sculptor to King George III. He studied sculpting at the Royal Academy and as a young man went to Russia where he spent 18 years under the patronage of the Tsar, travelling the country and sketching. On his return to England he married Martha Hankey, a sister of the Governor of the Bank of England, and settled in a large house in Avenue Road in Leamington. The overriding interests throughout his life were his Catholicism and conservative politics, and he wrote and published scores of political pamphlets and a number of books. In later life, he was looked upon as something of, a, of an elderly eccentric and an inveterate self-publicist and was a familiar sight in town wearing his trademark black coat and hat. In 1878, he organised a nationwide appeal for one penny from each working man for a gold wreath to be presented to Prime Minister Lord Beaconsfield, Benjamin Disraeli. But unfortunately, the Israeli declined to accept his finished wreath. His great eccentricity was to have his burial vault and headstone constructed several years before his death, and to have a huge rock placed near to it in memory of his father. In old age, he frequently visited the cemetery to sit on a bench near to the plot in quiet contemplation. He died in 1896 at the age of 84. And that's it for now. I hope you found this short presentation interesting and hopefully Barry will soon be back giving his actual walking tours around the cemetery. Bye for now.